So this is a dogwood tree. This is our native dogwood. And if you were going to plant a tree in your garden, this is a tree that you want to plant. Now this tree is pretty old. They don't always last this long, but this one has a lot of space. It's generally what we would call an understory tree. By understory, we mean it's under the canopy of the larger trees. So you will often see them on the edge of the park or the edge of a woodland. In um, springtime, they will have either a pink or a white, what you might consider the flower, right? But it's not actually the flower, it's the bract. And it's called Cornus, Cornus, where the dog comes from, the name dog, and Florida. So that is the flower part, so flowering dogwood. One of the reasons it's such great wildlife value, and it, as you can see, if you look close in the spring, there are little yellow flowers. These little yellow things are actually the flower. And from those flowers will come little red berries. And that's what the birds like. They will eat those into the spring. It's here. So I'll pass it around and you can see that these are the buds for Thank you. the spring's flowers. This is our spice bush. Okay, so here we go, pass it around. Scratch it and sniff. If you scratch the, um, the bark, you will smell a spicy smell. It's a, it's a shrub, what we would call an underlayer or sort of the understory layer for birds and animals. In addition to the canopy, we need this lower layer, not the ground layer, but this middle layer, particularly for birds, caterpillars, butterflies, to find a place to, to nest or to hide out, right? This is starting to get little flowers on it. So here are the flowers that will be coming out here in about March or April. Gets lovely green leaves that last throughout. Gets a beautiful fall color, a very uh, sort of golden yellow color in the fall. And if it's a female, you need a male and a female plant. It's called dioecious, meaning two houses. So you need a male and a female. Then you will get berries. You can also use this as a medicinal plant and to make tea from the twigs and the, um, the, the leaves. This is another interesting uh, tree uh, for winter interest. Um, this is a hemlock. Not to be confused with the hemlock that killed Socrates. Not the same, okay? Um, this is a Suga, T-S-U-G-A, Suga canadensis. So canadensis generally means it's from this area. These Latin names do have meaning. It's evergreen, and this is the Pennsylvania state tree. We're having a little bit of problem, and we're, we're beginning to see that climate change is making a difference because these are very endangered in our zone. Me do most of you live in media area? Okay, so media is what we would call zone seven. This is a USDA zone for gardening, right? Mm -hmm. We used to be zone six in my lifetime. Of course, I'm old, older than most of you, but in my lifetime, we were in zone six. We are now zone seven, and this is happening all around the country where the zones are getting hotter and hotter. So this poor tree is not doing well in our zone, even though it's our state tree. So up in the mountains, it does a little bit better, but in this uh, area, it's a little too humid now. It gets too hot but it's getting a, a something called woolly adelgid. This one's looking pretty good, but if you look at them, sometimes you'll see a little white fuzzy thing underneath. And it's, it's starting to affect them very badly. But it's a beautiful tree. They get very majestic and tall. And when they do come down, we leave them because they create habitat for many, many, many other uh, animals and insects. We'll talk about that later. The white pine is the eastern white pine. It's native to. It's in this area, and um, a lot of people plant them in the yard because they grow quickly. They feed a lot of birds, they provide habitat for birds, and like the hemlock, the pine and many of our spruces 
you can actually take the needle and make a tea out of it. The only evergreen that I'm familiar with in this area that you absolutely don't want to eat is a um, taxis. Let me see, what is that? A yew. You do not want to eat the yew. That's not native. But these you can make a tea out of. Um, here we go. Pass this around. These are the cones. This is a small cone from this tree. One of the issues with this tree is that because it grows quickly, it's a little brittle. So sometimes you will see on the roadsides that the branches have broken if we have like an ice storm. But in general, it's a very valuable tree. It's fine to put like around, if you have a, a, a yard where you have bordered on the, um, the woods, you can do that. But it is, it's a wonderful tree and this fragrance is just lovely. Okay, so if you look along this area, we notice that this is very wet, obviously. And if you can see this sort of mass right here, and if you look over there, you'll notice there are little things hanging. They're catkins that are hanging from that tree, right? And that is um, one of the ways that you can identify this tree. It's a smooth alder. It's Alnus cerulata. So Alnus is the alder tree. And this is a great tree for, or shrub, for birds. They will eat those catkins. It's something that works very well along a stream. And it's pretty easily identifiable once you see that. There aren't too many things that have that particular kind of a catkin that stay on like that all year. So that's one of our trees that, uh, or shrubs that we would look at. Obviously you need a pretty good space for it if you were gonna put it in your garden, it's kind of big. But any place you have a wet area, it helps to stabilize the ground. It's a, what we would call a high wildlife value plant because many, many birds, insects, animals uh, will use that either for food or for nesting. Let's see it here. This is what we would call a red osier or a red twig dogwood. If you look at the twigs, if you can get a little closer, they're really red. Um, we use this again along a stream. It will send out runners. We call it stolen ephorus. It will send stolons out and stabilize the stream. If you want to make use of the red twig aspect of it, if you had it in your garden, you would cut it down every so often or maybe cut sections of it down and the new growth coming out would be this bright red color. And some of them are bright yellow, bright orange. There are various cultivars, but it's a lovely shrub to have in your own garden. And uh, it's very easy to root it because you just stick it in water and roots will come out. It doesn't look like much now, but in the spring, it gets a lovely white flower that produces a, a fruit, a berry, that gets eaten very quickly by the birds and other animals. And then the next one is a red bud. I'm sure many of you have seen red bud trees. It's called red bud because it gets a beautiful red pink flower. It's in the pea family. If you were to come by here in the uh, summer, you would see a pod that looks like a pea. What you'll notice is that the twig is zigzag. There's going to be this node, and then it zigs off that way. There's another node, and it zigs off that way. So each of these nodes is going to be a leaf come springtime. And the leaves are really pretty. They're heart-shaped. This is a sweet gum tree. And it has a very distinct leaf, which I don't have for you right now, but I bet that most of you yeah. will recognize this. Oh, yeah. This is mm -hmm. a sweet gum ball, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It around. Yeah. We call them monkey balls. Monkey balls. <laughs> right? You shake it around. Yeah. So they're really fun. There you go. You shake it around. Not so fun if you step on them in bare feet. But what, what I do with them is I collect them. I don't have one of these trees at home, but I collect them and I stick them in my container to keep the squirrels out. So that's kind of a fun thing to do. But the sweet gum is a beautiful, beautiful tree. 
It has a very unique leaf. If you want to look it up online, it's a liquid ambar sarasa fluid. You don't have to remember that. There will not be a test. But if you look up sweet gum, it has a five pointed leaf. It gets spectacular fall color. And it's a really interesting tree. And it will get very, very large. So if we look up here, this tree right here, you can see there are little things up there. If you don't have your binoculars, it's hard to see. But these are the seed heads that are left over that we're passing around. This is a very significant tree in this area. We have many of them. We try to keep them. It gets a really unique flower in the springtime that looks like a green and yellow tulip. But up there, all of the seed heads are still on there. And sometimes we'll be walking through here if it's very windy, and they will just all cascade down. And they, the, each of those, you can pull one off, each of those little seed heads comes off, and it's winged, and it's a way for it to get around. It's a traditional tree in this type of a forest that we have here. So you will notice as we go through the park, there are a lot of downed trees. Look at this huge one here. We leave them when we can because they create a lot of habitat. This is called partridge berry. And it's evergreen and it lives in a very unique habitat. Our woods are generally acidic in this area, mostly acidic. So this likes a lot, a very acid soil. It's living on this trunk. And probably the way it got here was, it has a little teeny weeny fruit. You can hardly see this, but it's a little tiny red fruit. And in the spring, it gets a white flower. <laughs> it takes two flowers to make a fruit. And then the birds or whatever will eat it and move it around. So that's probably how it got here. But it's been here for an incredibly long time, just living on this trunk. Further down this trail, if you were to follow along the shingle mound, there's a whole area where it gets low. And in the spring, you will see them. And some of the skunk, skunk cabbage leaves will get this big. It's one of the first, the earliest blooming flowers. They will actually bloom in the snow. It has a space. It's kind of like a, <clears throat> like a, like a hoodie, right? And inside of that little hoodie is a round ball. And on the ball are the little flowers. And it will actually melt the snow. There's a, a chemical inside of it, a, a process, and it melts the snow. And there's a very specific type of insect, and I don't remember what it is. It might be a fly or a beetle, that comes to it. And it smells like carrion, meaning rotting flesh. And it looks like rotting flesh. And that's very specific relationship that they've developed. So we have tons of it here. And just want to mention that it may be our oldest wildflower because if the roots are not disturbed, they can live 200 years. Since we're on the Mountain Laurel Trail, if you look around, you'll see this slightly evergreen plant. That's the Mountain Laurel. Mountain Laurel is the state of Pennsylvania state flower. It's a cluster and you can see here, Stephanie, we must have had flowers at some point. There's oh, yeah. the leftover buds of the flower. Can oh, you wow. see that? These are not flowering as much as they used to because of climate change. <laughs> they like a very specific type of environment. You can see they're all on this hillside. We didn't see any on the other side. So it's shady, it's hilly, they cling on and they're holding the hillside in essentially. But these are the, the um, seed heads of last year's uh, flowers. Um, it's kind of getting endangered in this area, again, due to climate change. You'll see them in the mountains of Pennsylvania, quite a few of them, but it has a really unique flower. If you're lucky enough to see one, um, when the flower is ready to send out its uh, seeds uh, or its, um, it's a pollen, it springs. There are little tiny uh, stamens inside and they pop open. It's really cool. This is witch hazel. And you know witch hazel, it's used for as an astringent. That's what this is. You can still see some of the uh, flowers left on. 
it blooms in the uh, um, fall. Not at the springtime, it blooms in the fall. They run November in the park usually. Yeah, November. Yeah. And uh, it's like a little strap like yellow flower. So if you come through and you see that, it's a, it's a funny little flower, but it's strap-like looking. I won't go through and get it, but just remind yourself to look. And there are still some leaves left on from uh, from the spring. But I didn't I did want to point out with hazel because we have a number of them here. We have a couple of huge ones. It's a great wildlife plant. Um, it gets a little nut lid on it, like a little seed, and the birds will eat the seeds. But uh, it's very uh, endemic to this type of uh, an area. We have lots of them. Everybody knows the holly, right? There are many hollies. We looked today at the winterberry holly, which was deciduous. Deciduous, it drops its leaves. This is an evergreen holly. And even though we see evergreens around, they do drop their leaves eventually, even pines and whatever. You would not want to have this holly right next to your patio because in the summer, if you're walking out in your flip-flops or your bare feet, it would really get you. <laughs> but the holly is, again, the dioecious. You need a male and a female. I'm not seeing any fruit on here. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's not a female. The fruit could have been eaten already. This is our American holly. There are English hollies and Japanese hollies and lots of different ones. This is Ilex opaca. Gets a red berry. Birds absolutely love it. If you have any place in your yard to put it, not only do they get the fruit, but they will build nests in there and it provides habitat for them. Holly is not technically native up this high. When we say native, it's kind of a, you know, <clears throat> a wishy-washy term. I generally talk about what's east of the Mississippi in the mid-Atlantic states where we find ourselves. This is generally a little bit further south, like Mount Holly, New Jersey, mm -hmm. right? But because of climate change and because of the birds, they are sort of creeping up. And they also creep in from people's yards. There's so much to learn about trees, but the main thing I want you to understand as we finish this up with this tree and all these trees is that all of these trees are connected underground. There's an entire network of mycelium, which is a, um, like a fungus and it communicates. We don't pay attention to this stuff, but these trees are communicating. Underground, there's a whole lot more happening that we see up above. And it's making life better for us. It's filtering our water, it's keeping the soil in place, it's taking care of the birds. We breathe in oxygen and they breathe in our carbon dioxide and they express oxygen. So essentially, the other half of our lungs are up on top of these trees. So that's how important they are in our life. So think about that next time you hug a tree. Okay, I think we're good.